Welcome to your AP Statistics Chapter 4 lesson. Today we will be talking about displaying and summarizing quantitative data. Dealing with lots of, a lot of numbers. Summarizing the data will help us when we look at large sets of quantitative data. Without summaries of the data, it's hard to grasp what the data tell us. We just see a whole big bunch of values. The best thing to do is make a picture. We can't use bar charts or pie charts for quantitative data since those displays are for categorical variables. Histograms, displaying the distribution of earthquake magnitudes. This chapter example discusses earthquake magnitudes. First, slice up the entire span of values covered by the quantitative variable into equal width piles called bins. The bins and counts in each bin give the distribution of the quantitative variable. The beautiful thing about using your calculator is that the calculator will uh, divide the data up for you into bins. A histogram plots the bin counts as the heights of the bars, just like a bar chart. It displays the distribution at a glance. Here is a histogram of earthquake magnitudes. So it looks very much like a bar chart, but notice that there's no space between the bars unless there's an actual gap in the data. And that's because on the, um, on the horizontal axis, you've got a continuous quantitative variable. And so it's not just categories, it's actual values that, that represent the span across the bottom, actual quantitative values. A relative, histo relative frequency histogram displays the percentage of cases in each bin instead of the count. In this way, the relative frequency histograms are faithful to the area principle. Here is a relative frequency histogram of the earthquake magnitudes. Stem and leaf displays. Um, stem and leaf displays, or sometimes you'll hear them referred to as stem plots, show the distribution of a quantitative variable like histograms do while preserving the individual values. Stem and leaf displays contain all the information found in a histogram and when carefully drawn satisfy the area principle and show the distribution. Now you can't make them on your calculator but here's the deal on tests and the AP exam and much of your work in this class you're going to have to show a graphical display of the data so you're going to either have to copy what's in your calculator or just create something on your own and stem and leaf displays are usually pretty easy and quick to make um, and so many times these are what students prefer to make unless you have a huge amount of data and then in which case a histogram is easier compare the histogram and stem and leaf display for the pulse rates of 24 women at a health clinic which graphical display do you prefer To construct a stem and leaf display, first cut each data value into leading digits, which are your stems, and trailing digits, which are your leaves. So if we look back at the previous slide there, you can see on the left of the vertical line, you've got 8, 8, 7, 7, 6, 6, 5. Those represent the, the tens digit, okay, and those are the leaves. I mean the stems, excuse me, those are the stems, and then the leaves are on the right, um, and they represent the ones digit. So that first one on top there represents a pulse of 88, and then below we've got 80, 80, 80, 80, 84, 84, and then 76, 76, 76, 76, and then 72, 72, 72, 72. I do want to point out that this is a little bit fancier stem and leaf display. It's called a split um, stem display because if you'll look for each for each stem there's two horizontal rows the top one is for um, the digits five through nine and the bottom one the lower one is for digits zero through four all right so you use the stems to label the bins, they form the bins for you, and use only one digit for each leaf. Either round or truncate the data values to one decimal place after the stem. It's really nice when you have things like pulse rate that are, are um, you know, you just have a tens digit and a ones digit. It makes it really nice and easy to do stem and leaf displays. 
dot plots. A dot plot is a simple display. It just places a dot along an axis for each case in the data. The dot plot to the right shows Kentucky Derby winning times, plotting each race as its own dot. You, may, you might see a dot plot displayed horizontally or vertically. So here's an example of a horizontal dot plot where the counts are horizontal and then the winning times are listed on the vertical axis. If you make one in your calculator, it's going to be a vertical dot plot where whatever your variable is, it will be along the horizontal and then the counts will be along the vertical. It doesn't matter which one you use. I tend to make them vertically. Think before you draw again. Remember the make a picture rule? Now that we have option for data displays, you need to think carefully about which type of display to make. Before making a stem and leaf display, a histogram, or a dot plot, check the quantitative data condition. The data are values of a quantitative variable whose units are known. Now I will say your book puts um, a dot plot in the strictly quantitative um, category. Really, you can make a form of a dot plot where um, you count how many items are in each category. Um, and so really a dot plot you could use for categorical um, data as well, even if your book doesn't do that. Um, it's just that for stem and leaf displays and histograms, you have to have quantitative data. Shape, center, and spread. When describing a distribution, make sure to always tell about three things, shape, center, and spread. Later on, I'm going to tell you I really want you to add um, another thing called outliers. They're values that don't fit the regular pattern. So we're going to remember shape, outliers, center, and spread. And that makes a mnemonic device of socks. It's not spelled correctly, but S-O-C-S, -S, shape, outliers, center, and spread. What is the shape of the distribution? Does the histogram have a single central hump or several separated humps? Is the histogram symmetric? Do any unusual features stick out? So the humps. Does the histogram have a single central hump or several separated hump, uh, humps or bumps? A hump in a histogram are called modes. It's where you have a, a large number of observations. A histogram with one main peak is dubbed unimodal. Histograms with two peaks are bimodal. Histograms with three or more peaks are called multimodal. A bimodal histogram has two apparent peaks. So we can see here that there are two apparent peaks there, one between 70 and 110 and one there between 110 and 150. A histogram that doesn't appear to have any mode and in which all the bars are approximately the same height is called uniform. Symmetry. Is the histogram symmetric? If you can fold the histogram along a vertical line through the middle and have the edges match pretty closely, the histogram is symmetric. So the histogram on the left there is symmetric because if we fold it along the dotted line, um, you would match up the two halves of the histogram fairly well. But the one on the right, and you, can, you can't fold it in the middle so that the two sides almost match, it, there's just no way to do it. It's just very different. So it's not symmetric. The, the usually thinner ends of a distribution are called the tails. If one tail stretches out further than the other, the histogram is said to be skewed to the side of the longer tail. So the skew is in the direction of the tail not the peak. People get that backwards all the time. It's skewed in the direction of the tail. In the figure below, the histogram on the left is said to be skewed left because its tail trails to the left. The left tail trails out further. While the histogram on the right is said to be skewed to the right because the right tail trails out further. Anything unusual. And again, this is kind of where outliers are going to fit into the, the description. Sometimes it's the unusual features that tell us something really interesting or exciting about the data. Um, you should always mention any stragglers or outliers that stand off away from the body of the distribution. Are there any gaps in the distribution? If so, we might have data from more than one group. The following histogram has outliers. There are three cities in the leftmost bar, and they're really far away from the, the bulk of the data, and so they lie outside of what we would expect, and so we call them outliers. Where is the center of the distribution? If you had to pick a single number to describe all the data, what would you pick? 
It's easy to find the center when a histogram is unimodal and symmetric, it's right in the middle. On the other hand, it's not so easy to find the center of a skewed histogram or a histogram with more than one mode. But honestly, people like to know one single number that kind of gives the overall impression. And so you would pick some sort of average, something for the center. So like we talked about or read about and had a lot of statistics, there's the mean, there's the median. Those are both um, good value, values, better in some cases than others. And we'll, we're going to talk about when to report the mean and when to report the median. And also the mode sometimes if you're not given any numerical values, if all you're given is the histogram, sometimes reporting the mode where the hump is, that, that is helpful. Center of a distribution median. The median is the value with exactly half the data values below it and half above it. It is the middle value, once the data values have been ordered, that divides the histogram into two equal areas. So in the histogram, the, the data values have been ordered because you've got that scale across the bottom. But if you're looking at a list of data, make sure that it's been ordered before you go and try to find the median. Um, the median has the same units as the rest of the data. How spread out is the distribution? Variation matters, and statistics is all about variation. Are the values of the distribution tightly clustered around the center or more spread out? Always report a measure of spread along with a measure of center when describing a distribution numerically. Although people like to know just the average, either the median or the mean, occasionally the mode, Really, you need to know how much spread there, there is, how much variability there is, in order to have a good idea of what's going on throughout the distribution. Spread, home on the range. Um, the range of the data is the difference between the maximum and minimum values, so range is max minus min. A disadvantage of the range is that a, a single extreme value can make it very large, thus not representative of the, the data overall. The interquartile range. Uh, the interquartile range lets us ignore extreme data values and concentrate on the middle of the data. To find the IQR, or interquartile range, we first need to know what the quartiles are. And let me just tell you, don't try to form an analogous understanding of these statistical quartiles and the whole quartile system at Houston Christian. It's kind of backwards and done in a different way. They don't mean the same thing at all. So you just need to not try to make them mean the same thing and just realize that statistical quartiles are something different. Quartiles divide the data into four equal sections. One quarter of the data lies below the lower quartile, Q1. So Q1 marks off the lowest 25% of the data. One quarter of the data lies above the upper quartile, Q3. So the third quartile marks off the highest 25% of the data. The quartiles border the middle half of the data. Now, there's no Q2. Okay, Q2 would mark off the 25% between Q1 and Q2, and then it would mark off the 25% between Q2 and Q3. The reason we don't talk about Q2 is because that is exactly the median. So the median does um, fill that role. So it's minimum value to first quartile, that's 25% of the data. First quartile to median, that's another 25% of the data. Median to third quartile, that's another 25% of the data. And then third quartile to maximum is the last 25% of the data. The quartiles border the middle half of the data. The difference between the quartiles is the interquartile range. So IQR is upper quartile minus lower quartile, or Q3 minus Q1. The lower and upper quartiles are the 25th and 75th percentiles of the data. So the IQR contains the middle 50% of the values of the distribution as shown in the figure below. So the middle 50% of um, her uh, earthquake magnitudes are between 6.6 .6 and 7.6, and so the interquartile range there is 1. Five-number summary. Um, the five-number summary of a distribution reports its median, quartiles, and extremes, maximum and minimum. The five-number summary for the recent tsunami earthquake magnitudes look like this. The maximum is 9, 
6.0, the third quartile 7.6, the median is 7.0, the first quartile is 6.6, .6, and the minimum is 3.7. So 25% of the earthquakes are from 3.7 to 6.6, .6. another 25% are between 6.6 .6 and 7.0, another 25% are between 7.0 and 7.6, and finally, another 25% are between 7.6 .6 and 9.0. Um, another way to, to measure the middle is the mean. It really should be used only in symmetric distributions. When we have symmetric data, there is an alternative other than the median. If we want to calculate a number, we can average the data. We use the Greek letter sigma to mean sum and write Y bar or X bar, your book uses Y bar for the average. Um, your calculator is going to use X bar. It looks just like that Y bar there, just an X with the bar on top of it. It doesn't matter. Okay, we could use R bar. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. But people typically use either X bar or Y bar. And it's going to equal the total of all the observations, the sum of the observations divided by the number of observations. Just like you figure your average test grade. You add up all your test grades and you divide by the number of tests. The formula says that to find the mean, we add up all the values of the variable and divide by the number of data values in. The mean feels like the center because it is the point where the histogram balances. So it's the balancing point. Okay, the, uh, mean or median. Because the median considers the, only the order of values, it is resistant to values that are extraordinarily large or small. It simply notes that they are one of the big ones or small ones and ignores their distance from the center. To choose between the mean and median, start by looking at the data. If the histogram is symmetric and there are no outliers, use the mean. However, if the histogram is skewed or with outliers, you are better off with the median because it is resistant to the outliers and um, it will give you a better feel for the center of the data. Okay, we're going to come back um, in video two and pick up here and talk about standard deviation. So I will be talking with you again in just a minute.